and today we are presenting Magna Carta History Lessons 1215 uh, through 2014 and actually right up here to the present day because it is tomorrow on June the 19th that we celebrate the 800th anniversary of the promulgation of Magna Carta by the barons at Runnymede assembled who, um, uh, had, who had forced uh, evil King John, King John Blackland, to uh, uh, seal, not sign, but seal Magna Carta on the field of Runnymede on June 15th of 1215, not counting on him to follow it unless it was published. It was published thereby by the barons at Runnymede uh, on June 19th, uh, 1215, 800 years ago tomorrow. So without further ado, I turn to First Court of Appeals Justice Terry Jennings. Good morning. Uh, I opened my uh, Texas Bar Journal uh, not too long ago this last week and I thought maybe it might be appropriate to open uh, our session with this quotation uh, from the essay winner of the uh, Law Day 2015 contest, and the theme of which was Magna Carta. Uh, the author is Angela Kang. Uh, she opens her essay this way. The Magna Carta, from its conception, has served a crucial role in developing modern-day democracy and protecting individual liberties. Though it first started as an open-ended, situational document, the idea of preserving the law from an overreach of authority has had a lasting and beneficial impact on citizens globally, throughout history, and today. Last spring, I had the privilege of going, uh, taking a uh, continuing adult education course at Rice University on the Magna Carta, and after that, I was asked to do a uh, presentation on it to uh, the St. Thomas More Society in Houston. I didn't want to do this by myself, so I recruited uh, uh, David Furlow and Ken Spain, who are really some, some of our best local historians, and also Murray Cohen, who couldn't be here today. Murray's house got flooded in Houston a couple of weeks ago, and he's dealing with the uh, problems of uh, uh, reconstruction and insurance adjusters and so forth. But the, the thing that struck us the most when we... Uh, we're taking this class, and of course we got to see a copy of uh, the Magna Carta as it was uh, that was made a, not too long after the original document. Actually, the, the document they actually had at the uh, uh, Museum of Natural Science in Houston was much smaller, and, and the thing that impressed me the most about it, or the thing that struck me the most about it, was how small it really was. You know, you expect this, uh, this is a later copy, I think, with the, the King Seal and all that kind of stuff on it, uh, which is kind of a little more glamorous, but when you when we saw this document that was really uh, much more like the original, uh, it, it occurred to you know anybody looking at it uh, how small this was, and of course we couldn't understand it. It's in medieval Latin. It was written on sheepskin. Uh, it was written in ink made of water, dust, and powdered oak apple, and it consisted of about 4,000 words. Uh, but what we need, really need to understand about Magna Carta is that really what it was, was it, it, it was simply a treaty. It was a treaty between a bad king and a violent group of rebellious, uh, rebellious English barons. But as Churchill noted, and as Angela Kang noted, it serves as the foundation of principles and systems of government of which neither King John nor his nobles ever dreamed. What was drafted to protect the rights of the very few free men now protects, serves to protect the rights of all. And that's, that's the ongoing theme here, is that really kind of uh, these basic human principles were read into the document, and they've come to mean so much uh, that they really serve as the foundation of our American Revolution and our legal system. As Churchill more specifically noted, here is a law which is above the king and which even he must not break. This reaffirmation of a supreme law and its expression in a general charter is the great work of Magna Carta. And this alone justifies the respect in which men have held it. So what, what happened here, just to kind of give you a general outline before David takes us into some of the specifics. King John was a notorious oath breaker. So it was important for the barons to secure his seal to a written treaty. The, the idea that this had to be in writing was uh, of great importance. Subsequently, 
English coronations, English coronation oaths included promises to maintain statutory laws and customs of the country and of its inhabitants. The Queen's coronation oath reads, actually, the Archbishop will say to the Queen or the King, proposed King, will you, to your power, cause law and justice and mercy to be executed in all your judgments? And the Queen responds, I will. And again, the whole point here is that the rule of law matters even over the monarchy. And in our own presidential oath of office, the President of the United States, when he takes uh, office, pledges, I do solemnly swear or affirm that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. And of course, each uh, public office holder in Texas takes a similar oath. And the whole point here is that our duty is to a written constitution, not to any particular individual or monarch. So, what we're going to see here is David proceeds with the with a when he proceeds to cover about 800 years here in about uh, 20 minutes. We're going to see some general themes here. I'd like to outline for you. Uh, first is the idea of ideals. Uh, when when King John was in power, the people in England really focused on uh, King Edward the Confessor, who was considered to be the good king. And he had kind of been mythologized into this really great figure who was a king uh, who uh, followed the law and tempered his rulings with mercy. Another theme that you're going to see over, the, over the period of time here that we're going to cover is conflict, war and rebellion, battling a bad king, the appeal in subsequent years uh, in our American Revolution to the idea that uh, if a government's not living up to its ideals, if it's not living up to its principles, the people have a right to overthrow it. Revolution, war and rebellion again. Uh, again, and this, this uh, carries over to, into George III, uh, where basically uh, many of our founding fathers quoted and cited Magna Carta as a legal principle uh, to justify the American Revolution. It's a, uh, you're going to see a constant theme of legal struggles uh, to uh, preserve basic human rights because freedom truly is not free and in America we have what's, what we really consider very important which is the concept of public justice, the idea that uh, in an American courtroom uh, disputes can be resolved and justice can be worked out. And finally, we're going to close with a theme of stewardship, our responsibility of law as lawyers uh, to preserve these basic principles, which Ms. Kang, I think, so eloquently pointed out in her uh, uh, award-winning essay, that we have a responsibility not only to be good lawyers and good advocates and good judges, but we have a, we have a responsibility to the system itself and to maintain these principles. Now, with this, we're going to turn it over to uh, David, who's going to really take us through a lot of history here. And we're going to look through some history, but we're going to have we're going to try to have some fun with it. Here we go with uh, Edward, uh, the first confessor, as depicted on the Bio Tapestry in Bio France, uh, which was for Trivia Hounds, uh, the first French town liberated by Allied forces during the Second World War invasion of Normandy. So uh, here we have Edward depicted as the good and loyal king, um, to be contrasted, according to uh, King. Uh, later King William, earlier, uh, uh, who uh, came in from Normandy um, and challenged uh, the rule of Harold Godwinson, who claimed, he said, usurped the, ro uh, the rule of the English king. Uh, so, we're going to take a look here at Edward, who is the lost cause uh, Anglo-Saxon king, who represents the world before the Norman conquest of 1066. So here we actually have Another bio-tapestry depiction from the Norman royalist side of the uh, battle there. And there you see uh, Harold D. Rex, that is Harold King Godwinson, the person that uh, William displaced. And here we see him taking the arrow uh, at the climax of the Battle of Hastings in 1066. Edward dies in 1066. Before then... Uh, King um, uh, William uh, in Normandy, uh, who uh, was known at that time as William the Bastard, uh, 
had supposedly compelled Godwinson to swear on a Bible hidden beneath the table cloth like this that he would respect the right of William to serve as the next king uh, and without knowing it swore it and then this was the essence of the propaganda of William saying I'm the rightful king not Harold and he invades and his army proves the point. In fact if you see there you see a Saxon knight with a uh, with an axe being struck down by a Norman knight. And something just like this is what happened to uh, Harold Godwinson. Note where the man's hands are. That's what happened to Harold Godwinson. It was a brutal time. It was a time of royal power without the rule of law. English kings asserted a divine right to rule without any checks or balances. They always sought OPM, other people's money, through scooties, which essentially is... Latin and Norman for taxation to wage costly and un sometimes unsuccessful foreign wars. Their soldiers robbed the rich, stole from the poor, raped women, extorted property from everyone, and terrorized the population. And no one more so than my evil ancestor, King John. King John Blackland's Rebellion, what brought about the Magna Carta? In a, a unique set of circumstances, it inspired the legend of Robin Hood and the film The Lion in Winter. English nobles rebelled at King John's Angevin Ira et Malevin Mal Evolentia, or anger and ill will. That's the uh, phrase that appears in the documents. In other words, he was a tyrannical usurper, according to them. He raised taxes, scooted on knights, stole whole forests. You know, he looked not at the tree, but the forest, and he confiscated land of the nobles. He lost the Battle of Bouvines and France itself to the French, a combination of Bretons and Philip II. That's probably, in their eyes, the worst sin of all, that of losing wars to the French. He murdered hostages. He sold 12-year-old maids and widows. He fathered five children through adultery and one of his other worst sins at the time. He made jokes about the resurrection. Not your ideal ruler in a time of divine right kings. So let's take a look at the man. In 1189, at Chinon in central France, King Henry II was dying. His empire, covering all of England and vast areas of France, was crumbling. What eventually broke the aging king, though, was not the rebellions which threatened his kingdoms, but the discovery that one of the leading rebels was his youngest and favorite son, John. John was a wonderful calculator, but in the end there was something vicious in him which is always going to come out, always going to smile to your face and stab you in the back. He was violent, he was cunning, he was witty and uh, fun, uh, but he was also not to be trusted. Throughout his 17-year reign, the man who would be known forever as Bad King John betrayed those closest to him, persecuted the innocent, and was the first King of England to be accused of murder. Writing after John's death, a medieval chronicler said of him, he feared not God, nor respected men. His punishments were refinements of cruelty, the starvation of children, the crushing of old men. His court was a brothel, when no woman was safe. In other words, he did not work and play well with others. Here's what that kingdom looked like. And this is something that uh, uh, Judge Spain here had suggested that I present uh, to make people aware that it wasn't just England. He ruled large areas of France, as had his predecessor, Coeur de Leon, uh, Richard the Lionhearted, and his father, Henry II. And so, if you look over in the west, and down at the south here, towards um, essentially Bordeaux and Angoulême, this was the Aquitaine. And if you remember from um, the Lion in Winter, that's where his predecessor, Coeur de Leon, Richard the Lionhearted, kept insisting to Catherine Hepburn, and that was Anthony Hopkins, a very young one, if you remember, I will have the Aquitaine. Well, the Aquitaine or Western France was power, and it was taxation from all these established towns. And so uh, that's what King John inherited, and in Normandy. But the young heir could not hold the inheritance 
And here, for example, you see that he lost Normandy to the French and thereby ended up coming close to losing his crown. At Runnymede, and here, by the way, is that much smaller version of Magna Carta, the Hertfordshire edition that was actually displayed at the Houston Museum of Natural Science two years ago. As Justice Jennings said, it's much smaller and more compact than the much longer uh, bedecked with seals version you saw at the introduction here. This is what happened when somebody ran uh, Magna Carta through that uh, early redaction software in the, uh, in the court of, uh, in the English court. Uh, but June 15, 1215, that's when the barons compelled John to accept uh, a written limitation on his powers. And it was June 19th, that is tomorrow, the 800th year, that uh, they actually published it with the idea that, you know, don't, don't, tell me, don't tell me orally, I want it in writing. The essence of contract law in modern times. Rule of law. What did Magna Carta do? It precluded the king from interfering with or limiting the powers of the church. And that's right up there at the front and becomes, in its own way, a precedent for our own First Amendment. It barred imprisonment without a trial by jury and authorized habeas corpus. You have the body. Give us the body. Meaning that the king could not hold people in his dungeons without a good reason. It stopped the king from raising taxes before first consulting with England stakeholders, which at that time was considered to be the people who were the nobles who had the large tracts of land, the all-male nobles at that time. It took a long time for things to actually you know, evolve into our current protection of everyone's rights. It compelled the king to choose competent officials who understood and agreed to actually obey and enforce the law, a major step forward. Magna Carta required that everyone, even the king, and later even parliament when it arose, had to obey the law. The common law stood above all, after which the king and later parliament were subject. Those were major steps forward in the rule of law. So, what did it mean? Let's see. For freemen, later everyone, we have also granted to all freemen of our kingdom, for us and our heirs forever, right down to the present day, all the underwritten liberties to be had and held by them and unto their heirs of us and our heirs forever. So think of Fethman and Sison. Think of a will granting to all of the people of England these basic rights and liberties and to all of their descendants, including those English people who founded the 13 colonies across the way. This initial draft protected only the barons, but the barons later uh, decided to broaden the base of support in case they needed to stand up against this king again, which they soon did, uh, and that included everyone. And that, uh, that support came in handy just weeks later as this king uh, brought in his trump card. He who had disregarded the pope made a secret deal with the pope, and the pope came in here and essentially said that the king had acted ultra-virus, beyond his authority to give away his power to rule as a divine right king without any restrictions whatsoever. And this, of course, was the result of a you know, secret deal with Pope Innocent III, who was actually anything but innocent. Um, July 1215, the Pope declared Magna Carta, quote, not only shameful and base, but also illegal and unjust. Null and void. Not voidable, friends, but void. So it was bad from the start. September of 1215, the rebellion against John picks up two-thirds of the nobles in the realm of England and also Ireland, and those parts of France he still ruled. September, disregarding Magna Carta, the rebels actually offered the crown to the French king to come over and relieve them from this oppression. That's a measure of how bad John was. That's why he's King John I, and there's never been a John II or a John III. And in October 1216, after crossing the river up in Norfolk uh, and getting very sick, he died of sickness or poison, if you prefer a conspiratorial view of the world. So, this is what? A sarcophagus. And what would you expect that sarcophagus to be located in, since he was England's worst king? Why? In Worcester Theater, 
Worcester Cathedral in Worcester. And so that's where King John sleeps uneasily to the present day. Now, what's important to Magna Carta is what happened to it afterwards and as it evolved. As, as Justice Jennings and Ju Judge Spain pointed out to me when they brought me into this, John had a son who was much better than him. Of course, when you start that low, it's easy to improve. Boy King Henry III reissued Magna Carta to undercut his rival and said, look, we're English people. We don't need a French king, and I will limit my powers. Then, over the next four centuries, kings issued and reissued Magna Carta, carving out certain sections like the protection of the laws dealing with forest, one of the first environmental laws in the history of the world. As Parliament arose uh, under the Plantagenets and then under the Tudors and right up to the time of the Stuart Kings, uh, by Tudor times, Kings did little without Parliament's support until, of course, the Stuarts came in. And when the Stuarts came in, first James I of Scotland and England and then his son Charles I began proclaiming their right to rule as divine right kings, absolute monarchs, without any inhibitions of law and not subject to the common law. And that led Sir Edward Coke to cite Magna Carta in his Petition of Right of 1628 in the long battle between Parliament and King Charles I, which ended up in 1649 when King Charles I finished his reign nine inches shorter than when he began it, <laughs> thanks to uh, Cromwell and uh, uh, Cromwell's Parliament who decreed that the king should be executed for treason to his subjects. 1770, William Pitt, who was the pro-American uh, leader of the English Parliament, hailed Magna Carta as, quote, the Bible of the English Constitution. And so it was. Here is a picture of Sir Edward Coke, who was Attorney General um, of England under Elizabeth. He transformed Magna Carta by doing what a good appellate judge does, is redefining the issues and reframing them in a way that permits change. Living from 1552 to 1634, he served as Attorney General, AG for Elizabeth I, and as Chief Justice during the reign of James I. So he knew the courts inside and out. He reinterprets Magna Carta as a limit on royal authority because Charles I refused to be limited or restrained. Magna Carta is such a fellow, he said, that he will have no sovereign. Coke wrote in his Institutes of English Law. Magna Carta was the framework, the constitution, the common law embodied that was over and above English kings and later parliament. So here we have his first part of the Institutes. This is the book in which he rewrote Magna Carta and created the framework of the unwritten British constitution. And in his second part, 1641, published years after his death, on the verge of the rebellion against Charles I that led to the English Civil Wars. That's where his book was published. Chapters 38 and 39 of Magna Carta were the, quote, roots, unquote, from which many fruitful branches of the law of England have sprung. As the Petition of Right, 1629, he filed in Parliament showed, justice had to be three things. Free, for nothing is more odious than justice for sale, or to sale, as he put it. Uh, second, full, for justice ought not to live or be granted piecemeal, and speedy, for delay is a kind of denial. And when all these meet, that is, justice is free, full, and speedy, then you have both justice and right. And those are the foremost concepts of justice in America to this day, continuing from Magna Carta in the field of Runnymede, which just means is because Magna Carta came on English ships to Jamestown and Plymouth and Boston and all of the other colonies along the American seaboard, where, looking back over time, we can say, things go better with Coke. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because he gave us the framework of our own constitution and our own rule of law. The Virginia Company, 1606, Referencing uh, colonists had all the rights, liberties, and immunities that they would have had under English law. That means they were Englishmen of equal par with their colleagues back in England. 
1641, the Massachusetts General Court, one of the first freely elected bodies chosen by the people who actually were uh, uh, subject to it, based its Massachusetts Body of Liberties directly on Magna Carta Chapter 29. 1644, Sir Edward Coke's law clerk, Roger Williams, enshrines uh, Coke's ideas in the Charter of Rhode Island Plantation, and he was the law clerk, the man who gave the world the first complete promise of complete religious freedom by constitution in that charter was in fact the law clerk of Sir Edward Coke. 1679, William Penn prints Magna Carta in America and thus makes it available to every court and every commoner in the colonial, the 13 colonies. So this comes in, Magna Carta uh, thus informs law students and first law professor in America, Edward Wythe, who taught uh, Thomas Jefferson, by the time of the Stamp Act crisis. And that's when uh, American colonists began to assert that if Parliament acted against the common law, acted against Magna Carta, then Parliament's laws were void and null and without basis. And that became the idea that set a fire the 13 colonies, who sought to protect traditional jury trial rights um, in the Great Charter, as set forth by, amongst other people, William Blackstone. And so these are the bases, the intellectual bases, of what became the rule of law in America and the Constitution. It specifically ignites the Revolution, 1763 to 1781. You see it cited by all the founding fathers. John Adams, George Wythe, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, all cite Magna Carta as creating individual rights, citing John Locke's exposition of Magna Carta. 1765, the Massachusetts Assembly, inspired by James Otis's Brits of Assistance case, declares the Stamp Act, quote, against the Magna Carta. Note that's the first argument. It's against traditional common law and the natural rights of Englishmen, and therefore, according to Lord Cope, no one void. Opposition to the Stamp Act essentially begins the path to revolution to Lexington and Concord. In February 17, 1826, the year in which Thomas Jefferson and John Adams would survive uh, to the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, July 4, 1826, and both die on the same day, Thomas Jefferson writes to James Madison about Coke's Institute saying that, quote, a sounder Whig never wrote, nor a profounder learning in the orthodox doctrines of the British Constitution, or in what were called English liberties. So Magna Carta, now I turn this over to my colleague, Judge Spain, to tell you about what Magna Carta specifically does. And I want to preface this, if you've noticed that I have a purple wristband, this is not because I got out from the psych ward, or was it a rock concert last night? I was at Boy Scout camp all week and get to go back this afternoon to North Texas. So, just so you know. Thank you for joining us. All right, long drive. Well, since we're being very British this morning, part of the truth behind Magna Carta is, is that these are a lot of promises that extended to a few and extend to many if we choose to extend them to many. And part of the charge that we'll get to in the end is, is that this document and these similar documents have to be alive to mean anything. Otherwise, they're just words on paper and you don't go anywhere. And the tension between people who declare these wonderful rights and then do things like the Alien and Sedition Acts, promptly after they write the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, has, has gone on before. So to be British, uh, what has happened has happened before and will happen again. So let's see how this comes over uh, into the United States and specifically into Texas. So uh, you get in Magna Carta rights uh, like having justice at a fixed place, uh, which is where we get having justice dispensed in the county seat, to be honest with you, in the Texas Constitution. P.S. is a trial lawyer, unless you're in JP court, do not try your case outside the, the county seat because your judgment is void. Uh, you also get uh, credible witnesses testifying against people out of Magna Carta. So the, the, biggie, the biggie in Magna Carta, in my opinion, is Chapter 39, which is essentially where we get due process. And if you want to throw yourself back into the turmoil of con law class, we're going to be talking about procedural due process instead of pure substantive due process today. So that ought to give you some relief. 
But if due process is notice and an opportunity to be heard, uh, see what you say, uh, what you see here on chapter 39, and see if it reminds you of where we are. So what we have is that you have to have, uh, you can't have your property or your uh, taken away from you or be outlawed or exiled or be ruined, save by the lawful judgment of your peers and the law of the land. That to me is that's due process where it enters into the equation. Uh, the fact that we're not going to sell justice in Chapter 40, uh, that's also a, a notable goal, and we certainly hope we aren't doing that. Although, like I said, these rights are only real if we continue to make them real. So, turning to the United States Constitution, you have the Supremacy Clause in Article 6, which harkens back to the idea that no one's above the law. Uh, in many ways, this was the whole problem of the Articles of Confederation, that we had all these 13 colonies and nobody was playing on the same page. And the Constitution came in and said, no, we're going to have a rule that applies to all. Over on uh, in, in Article 1, Section 9, you have habeas corpus, uh, which can be suspended and at the federal level. Most of you know that Lincoln famously did it during the Civil War. So it can happen. In the Texas Constitution, you can't suspend the writ of habeas corpus. So there's a difference there. No ex post facto laws or bills of attainer. Trial by jury. And in the Fifth Amendment, you get an explicit reference to due process that comes in there. Now, for me, you... Uh, we have the Sixth and Seventh Amendment rights to public trial and confrontation of witnesses, but it's the Fourteenth Amendment that I think all of us uh, see as the main engine of, of due process, where you can't deprive a person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Uh, this is huge. You have to tell people what's going to happen to them, and you have to let them show up in open court and talk about it. And we take that for granted but if you don't do it that way, you're back in Star Chamber and all of that kind of good stuff. Now, one of the comments that about the 14th Amendment, understand the 14th Amendment is one of the Civil War amendments. So as we go through this narrative, I'm going to get a little bit out of sync because we're going to go back to the Texas Constitution. But the application of due process and this concept extending to every person is not something that was there from the beginning. Certainly wasn't there at Runnymede. It certainly wasn't there when the Constitution came out in uh, 1779. So it's an organic process. process. And I will briefly go back to uh, the history of Texas as part of the Mexican uh, government because this is one of the things that we have covered recently and we'll cover again in our Texas Supreme Court Historical Society and Journal. Uh, Texas, of course, begins... Um, as a Spanish province and then becomes part of Mexico when Mexico won its independence in 1821. Texas and other provinces, the Yucatan, various northern provinces, all rebelled against the centralist, that is the dictatorial usurper, Santa Ana and the Santanistas. So uh, those Texans were summoned to a convention uh, by Stephen F. Austin and by Lorenzo de Zavala, who became the first vice president of the Republic of Texas, uh, he was also one of the individuals who had signed the Mexican Constitution, Federal Constitution of 1824, based in part on um, the American Constitution and Magna Carta. So it was here at Washington on the Brazos, and this is a reconstructed picture of this essentially um, rural building type of barn in which the delegates, including Sam Houston, Lorenzo de Zavala, and others, met on Washington on the Brazos River, and in Independence Hall, crafted a constitution and a declaration of independence, but the constitution carrying forth many of the concepts of Magna Carta. Um, that dispersed as the Texans engaged, that group dispersed as the Texans engaged in the runaway scrape, pulling back with Sam Houston or ahead of him in advance of the pursuing Mexican forces. Now, I would here you have the San Jacinto Battleground, and if you note over there at what is here on the far left side, a series of buildings across the bio, this will give you one of the reasons that Santana actually came all the way to the San Jacinto Battlefield in 
East Texas. He was pursuing that signer of the Mexican Constitution of 1824 who had helped lead Texas into rebellion, Lorenzo de Zavala, for whom our state archives are named. And if I can interject, since flooding seems to be a big issue in the state these days, <laughs> the, 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 the de Zavala was buried at San Jacinto, and that's been washed away. He's not there anymore, and so uh, I don't. Somewhere in the Gulf of Mexico, or in the Atlantic, or maybe on the British coast somewhere, he is. But yes. flooding's not anything new. Flooding is nothing new, and you can see his house right there on what is the far left-hand side of this screen. Um, and of course, the Battle of San Jacinto determined that Texas would no longer be a province of Mexico, not a Mexi not part of Coahuila y Teos but would be the Republic of Texas. And here, one of the very first things the leaders of the Republic of Texas did was they began publishing the laws and the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. And thanks to Lorenzo de Zavala, they also published them uh, within a few years' time. He, dictate, he uh, had passed the law that said that they all had to be in Spanish so all the citizens of the Republic could read the law in their own language. 1836's Constitution, according to Jim Harrington, the one of the foremost experts on the constitutional rights litigation in Texas, uh, was based in good part on British common law, Spanish civil law, and the ideals in Magna Carta. So we see how Magna Carta passes on over the centuries, uh, continually renewing uh, the basis for human liberty in the Western Hemisphere in the United States and in Texas. And specifically, as uh, I will allow Judge Spain to tell you about uh, uh, the due course of law and open courts provisions. Well, this is the Texas Supreme Court Historical Society, and one of the things that I think as we look back at 1836, it's easy to forget, is what was Independence Day from tex for Texas from a European power? That would be September 16th, 1821. And so we were part of the Spanish crown, and then we weren't, and then we were part of Mexico, and then we had the Texas Revolution. And so I think everybody in here understands we ended up originally with Spanish-Mexican law before the adoption of the common law in 1840? 1840. 1840. And so we have a rich tradition, you know, of especially still in family law and water rights, of a different system. And there is some influence from the Mexican Constitution in 1824, Magna Carta, but I'm going to guess not a lot after the revolution. So we get to 1836, and we have lawyers who are writing the Constitution and put these ideas into the Texas Constitution. And you see uh, the due course of law uh, provision. How many people in this room do criminal law? You're going you're, you're gonna to make your due process and due course of law arguments separately in, in the hope sometimes that if the... That, that, uh, that if the federal constitution doesn't give you what you want, the Texas constitution may. And sometimes the Court of Criminal Appeals has found it that way. But we have what we call as the due course of law provision uh, that's in a couple of places in the constitution. Now, one thing I want to leave you with, and this is where I'm going to do the, the time switch with the 14th Amendment. You go to March 2nd, 8, uh, 1836, and we talk about that as Independence Day. But the question, again, is independence for whom? Who do all these rights belong to at any given point in time? And let us not forget that March 2nd, 1836, men, if you were black, you either needed to get out of Texas or you were going to become a slave. So when we get back to the 14th Amendment, which Texas was gracious enough to ratify as part of the Civil Rights Amendment and part of ending uh, Reconstruction, uh, you do have uh, due process, uh, at least in theory, applying to every person that lives in Texas. And thus we have Magna Carta and the basic rights of due process, due course of law, extending further and further to more and more groups throughout history, both English history and American and Texas history. And we now turn it over to Justice Terry Jennings. Let's talk about stewardship. Well, that was a lot of history, and uh, I want to tell you, David really, as you can probably tell, worked very hard in this presentation, and so did Ken. And, uh, one of the best ideas I ever had was bringing these two gentlemen onto this panel. <laughs> <laughs> well, and Murray Cohen. So. And, Murray Cohen. and Murray Cohen as well. Unfortunately, as, as we said before, he couldn't make it here. But you can see how a lot of these ideals have played out over 800 years. And, and the language is uh, very similar, as, as Ken, uh, Ken's uh, presentation demonstrated. And it works its way also into our uh, Texas Rules of Disciplinary Conduct and Judicial Conduct Code. 
uh, our very preamble to the Texas Rules of Disciplinary Conduct point out that lawyers, as guardians of the law, play a vital role in the preservation of society. Uh, judges have certain duties, which you can, you can tell uh, these duties really evolve from the basic principles enunciated in Magna Carta. A judge shall comply with the law and promote public confidence in the integrity and impartiality of the judiciary. Uh, during Ken's presentation, you saw that the United States Constitution talks about judges being bound by the law. So not only is the executive uh, bound by the law, but judges are bound by the law. Uh, Canon 3A, the judicial duties of a judge take precedence over all the judge's other activities. So a judge is supposed to do their work first, their judicial work first, before they do all their political stuff and uh, social stuff and uh, charity work. The, 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 uh, the canons say, state very clearly the judge is supposed to take care of all of the judicial business first. Canon 3B8, a judge shall accord to every person who has a legal interest in a proceeding or that person's lawyer the right to be heard according to the law. And then we get into a little bit more specifically about the role of lawyers in preserving this great system that we have. You know, uh, lawyers are not supposed to, of course, charge an unconscionable fee or, or uh, illegal or unconscionable fee. Uh, a lawyer should not abuse a fee arrangement based primarily on hourly charges by using wasteful procedures. Lawyers must not wage a war, wars of attrition. In the course of litigation, a lawyer shall not take a position that unreasonably increases the cost or other burdens of the case that unreasonably delays resolution of the matter. It's not only bad form, but it's it's bad for the system itself because of the perception of the public that they don't have access to justice because of such wars of attrition. So uh, they're a violation of the disciplinary rule to act in such a way. Lawyers have a duty to tell the truth. A lawyer shall not knowingly make a false statement of material fact or law to a tribunal or fail to disclose to the tribunal authority uh, controlling authority from uh, from the same jurisdiction. And so that kind of brings us uh, uh, to a point where just to basically kind of sum up here, uh, the, the common themes here from Magna Carta straightforward are justice is supposed to occur in a fixed place. That's the word used in Magna Carta. Uh, it's, it's used in the Texas Constitution about open courts that uh, justice is, is supposed to occur in a public setting because the public has an interest in the outcome of each and every case. And the public has an interest in what the facts are in a case. Uh, that also uh, brings to mind this whole concept, this great concept that we have, uh, the overarching concept really, that no one is above the law, that judges are supposed to follow the law, uh, not Judges are supposed to you know, create the law themselves. There's a danger in that. There's always been this uh, uh, running uh, uh, dispute throughout legal history in American Anglo-American uh, uh, Anglo jurisprudence. The idea of judges versus juries, the power of judges versus juries. This has been an ongoing uh, concern uh, since the inception of, of, of our common law system. Uh, and you see it in England. You know, Coke was run out of office. Uh, and you see it uh, working its way today in, in, you know, when you talk about the different judicial philosophies of people like Posner, who talk about, well, the judge is going to do what they're going to do, versus, uh, you know, the more formalist theory of, well, no, a judge is supposed to follow the law and supposed to follow a certain uh, uh, the form of the law. And the whole point of that, of course, is, is that you know, when you get down to the law being in writing, the whole basis, what is the whole basis of a rule of law? You know, if we're not supposed to have uh, a rule of men, we're supposed to have a rule of law, then judges have to follow the law. They're to be bound by the law. Judges shouldn't be issuing ad hoc decisions, especially at the appellate level, uh, which change or confuse the law or, or uh, bring in, uh, 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 you know, basic uh, criticisms of how the system isn't living up to its fulfillment. But this is, uh, this is not anything new. You know, Charles Dickens wrote in Bleak House uh, about the abuse of the Chancery Court system. I was, I was amazed when I saw that someone introduced a, a bill in the legislature to create Chancery Courts. And, you know, Dickens had basically, you know, 
wrote a you know 900 page novel criticizing the chancery courts in England, and the whole point being that uh, there that justice was being delayed. So you had this reform coming from without. So this whole idea that uh, you know. Uh, our, our system that I want to kind of bring it back to is that our system is based in conflict. The idea that people are going to be able to go into an American courtroom and fight it out so that the truth can come out and so the right result can come out. And you, you talk about this common theme of, you know, these barons never meant any of these principles to apply to any of us. They meant to apply it to themselves. And then, out of political expediency, they then applied it to free men. And then over time, uh, you know, through people like Coke and Blackstone and then our own founding fathers, these principles began to apply to everyone. And now we have this great issue in front of our United States Supreme Court about uh, uh, equal, equal uh, opportunity to marry. And a lot of these principles have just been playing out through 800 years, and they're going to continue to play out uh, throughout our history as long as we exist. So you have this whole idea that, you know, we have this appeal, uh, appeal to these ideals that, frankly, we don't live up to all the time. But I want to sum it up here, and then we'll hopefully have some time here for questioning. But I want to sum it up by, uh, some of you all may have been a, a member of Phi Delta Phi in law school, the, uh, the honor fraternity. And there was always a striking uh, quotation I want to talk about here from Phi Delta Phi, which, which really kind of, I think, brings to mind here what we're, what we're trying to do is, is to raise awareness of what a noble profession we're really involved in. And that, that reads this way. Demanding the noblest attributes of the mind and heart and the richest endowments of education, the practice of the law should be inseparable from the idea that it's the servitor of justice. Consider the importance of our profession. It calls upon you to be the preservers of freedom, the defenders of weakness, the unravelers of cunning, the investigators of artifice, the humblers of pride, and the scourgers of oppression. So long as our profession retains its character for learning and for virtuous boldness, the rights between people will be adjusted and well defended. And uh, you know, this is probably why a lot of us went to law school because we had these ideals. And uh, it's, as y'all have known, a lot of you probably fought some of these battles. It's, it's a profession worth saving when we're talking about the vanishing jury trial and justice not occurring in a public forum, and people uh, like our state bar president are writing articles about uh, you know, the relevance of our profession. Uh, we need to look no further than going back to Magna Carta and why we entered this profession in the first place to preserve these ideals and to keep fighting. To quote uh, Clarence Darrow, uh, it is the duty of the legal profession not only to preserve and protect those rights handed down to us, but to comfort the afflicted, and also to afflict the comfortable. <laughs> Here is uh, the American Bar Association's 1957 monument to Magna Carta at Running Me, a place where uh, the birthday, the 800th year birthday of the rule of law in the Anglo-American system of governance uh, had its origins. And you'll see there the starry sky there is where uh, is the rotunda under which many American lawyers, judges, and justices have been gathering to celebrate the 800th anniversary. One of those who celebrated Magna Carta as a restriction on the unlimited power of English kings was Rudyard Kipling. And I'm, I will end this session uh, and open it up to questions by quoting those lines from Rudyard Kipling. And still when mob or monarch lays to root a hand on English lays, the whisper wakes, the shudder plays across the reeds at running me. And Tim's that knows the moods of kings and crowds and priests and such like things rolls deep and dreadful as he brings their warning down from running me. Thank you for attending this program and for listening so intently. And if you uh, find that you've reawoken your love of history combined with law, then I can recommend 
Nothing more appropriate than joining our Texas Supreme Court Historical Society, and I would encourage you to examine for free our Texas Supreme Court Historical Society Journal. Our executive director, Pat Nestor, uh, is fully committed to uh, realizing the promises of the bar and to bringing you programs of this sort, and I thank him for the support in doing so. And the same is true for our new Houston Bar Association president, Lauren Gibson, who is committed to a Teaching Texas program to bring law to students in uh, high schools in Houston, in part to fulfill uh, Associate Justice Sandra Day O'Connor's commitment that we should all engage in promoting uh, civics and our understanding, our rights, but also our duties as citizens to preserve and protect and enhance the practice of law. Thank you. Thank you.